Hey there, heartthrobs. I'm Pruitt. This is Jim Davis, and I'm so excited today. Jim, I'm so ready to talk about Monster Hearts. I've always had this idea of Minotaur, never got to go to school, he found a way <clears> back because of a project. Right. So we're, get we're talking about the kiss. weird wasteland, though. Monster Hearts is the weird, weird wasteland. Well, yeah, I mean, whatever setting you want to put this in, it doesn't matter. He just wants to go back to school to get his first kiss because he's never gotten one. The Barbarian? The path, the path of the Monster Heart Barbarian for Weird Wastelands? One of the subclasses? Oh, I mean, uh, right. I was thinking classes, Monster Heart, High yeah. School. Um, no, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, let's talk about the subclasses for the Weird Wastelands for our Kickstarter that's ongoing here on yeah. uh, WebDM. One day. Worlds of WebDM Weird Wastelands is our first book, and it's live on Kickstarter now. It's an environment-based toolkit for DMs and players where we give you everything you need to create player-driven 5e games in the fantasy post-apocalypse. We're introducing new support for wilderness exploration, giving you a complete class, the Scion, 12 new subclasses, tons of locations with maps, monsters, NPCs, adventure hooks, and hey, it's us so you know we're going to include badass encounter tables and more. We're writing it exactly how we think a 5e book should be well organized, full of references, and our WebDM wisdom, with tips and support in how to make the content easily fit into any 5e game and run the best games of your life. Back it on Kickstarter now. Link here and in the comments and description. Okay, Jim. Now, uh, we have to keep them after class because it's it's a show on mm. subclasses, right? So yeah. uh, here we are. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're, the, we're in the last week of the Kickstarter. And and so it's yeah. time to talk about uh, some of these subclasses let's that we have designed for the Weird Wastelands. Uh, so let's start off with the Barbarian, uh, or as we're calling it, the Path of the Monster Heart. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a mm -hmm. it's a barbarian who like it, you know they're a wasteland warrior that is taking their power from the monsters that they eat that they consume a part of right mm -hmm. and and that consumption could be they they eat the heart or they have their blood transfused uh with it but they are like you know used to seeking out these dangerous beasts within the wasteland although technically beasts are not on the monster menu because they're beasts but you take my point uh <laughs> and uh you know seeks them out to gain these powers uh from them by, by like consuming them and that that should feel like powerful it should feel weird and odd it you know perhaps the the barbarian that exists that it's maybe the most reminiscent of is the wild soul with sort of like these odd powers that they get whenever they rage um the barbarian of the monster heart does this because that's how they survive like the monsters that are in the wasteland are they're the boss they're you know they're the the big baddies that, that walk around and terrorize settlements and you know eat travelers and people trying to seek a living out in this harsh place and like the barbarian sees that and goes i want that i'm going to take it uh and uh, yeah well, yeah i mean that that I mean that is one way to uh, to fit into the wasteland like you have a purpose you know and you hear oh no we're being besieged by you know <laughs> magicors and that barbarian's like oh it's one i yeah. need to check off the list and you uh -huh. know, haven't had one of those yet town. <laughs> yeah <laughs> my my mm. favorite oh what a delicacy <laughs> <laughs> mm. i've heard such tales <laughs> yeah 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 so like we want the class to be like complete in and of itself or the subclass rather to be like complete in and of itself but but because it is linked to the kinds of monsters that it's eating, it also presents us with the opportunity to include like custom abilities that are specific to a certain type of monster that then you can dangle in front of the barbarian of a monster arts uh, uh, character or player rather and say, you know, like you get the stuff that's in your class, but you could also go out and find these specific monsters to to mm -hmm. eat specific parts of them to get like special powers and yeah. and like that gets the barbarian player excited about wandering the wasteland looking for these creatures and and like mm -hmm. an element of gameplay of sort of like goal-oriented gameplay is introduced hey you gotta you gotta go out there and unlock those special features so you can have the special attack it's it's, you know, <laughs> it's codified in most games right um yeah so absolutely so, uh, how do we want players to feel when they when they decide you know what monster heart that's my jam 
Yeah, yeah. Or jelly, so however we, you create your monster. Exactly. It's an ooze or a construct or, yeah. Uh, <laughs> they are, we, we want the players to feel powerful. We want them to feel like that, you know, as they progress in level and abilities, that they, you know, become something that monsters fear, right? That that those monsters that are are cognizant of of what they're <laughs> what they're facing would be extra afraid because like this is a warrior that can can like take something from them and learn something from them and it almost like fights on their level, and so that's that straddling of the line between you know, person and monster that is sort of baked into the rage of Barbarian, yeah. of like Jekyll and Hyde, Hulk kind of thing. We really want to like mm -hmm. lean into that and and for them to just feel just brutal and ferocious as they as they use their abilities. Yeah, and uh, let's, uh, once we explain to them a little bit on the, uh, like kind of the hook, the mechanical hook that we're using to kind of relay that. Yeah, yeah. So we're looking to uh, hook their abilities into uh, this concept of them consuming or taking into themselves pieces of the monsters that they face. And so when we're, we're talking monsters here, we're using the broad category of monster, monster type, everything except for beasts and humanoids. So beast is covered by totem barbarian, conveniently enough. Uh, and humanoids is a bit outside the realm of our uh, conceptual framework. Uh, they're not cannibals. <laughs> Those yeah. would be ghouls. Uh, and so, um, That'll be in a later supplement. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, but we do want to leave on the table the weirder stuff, the constructs, the oozes, you know, there's something warped and twisted about the, the magic of the wasteland that allows a monster heart barbarian to gain this benefit from things that they might otherwise not think of. But like, I think it's kind of cool that your your barbarian would be like, well, Ken, is that angel like? Is it still? Can I can I have a taste? Can I can I get, can I get a snack of it? <laughs> uh, can I just get and one so, feather, just one feather, <laughs> right? And so we're looking at at other uh, you know classes that that feature borrowing from or interacting with uh, monsters, notably wild shape, as a kind of framework for how this might look, um, and and to give incentive for the monster heart barbarian player to seek out types of monsters to face in battle, to fight, to challenge themselves against, in order to gain new benefits for themselves nice and, and um like you said uh it really fits with the the weird wastelands going out eating oozes and jellies and stuff but like <laughs> if somebody saw this <clears throat> and they're not playing in a weird wasteland campaign how would you what, what's the pitch you would give those perspective those per perspective players to give their dms Mm -hmm. I say for non wasteland campaigns, the the monster heart barbarian could easily be like a villainous option for one of them, or if like one of the players is interested in playing with it, someone that is maybe from like an extreme sort of survivalist, uh, either warrior society or warrior tradition, uh, or something like that. I'm I think like leaning into the ferocity of them, the the fact that these aren't really trained warriors; they just overwhelm their opponents with with just sheer intensity of onslaught and then like take into themselves this this power <laughs> uh, of the enemies that they face um, mm -hmm. you know you could easily see a monster heart barbarian serving as just like a, a champion of a collection of villages it's just like this is a person that just sort of lives out here somewhere and, and keeps us safe from the the dark uh, horrors that stalk uh, D D worlds and the like um or you could sort of like take the class features of it and break them apart and turn them into feats or or special abilities that that the pcs can acquire through like learning them from other npcs or as a reward for a certain quest or something or like as temporary benefits you know so it's like all right for this one adventure you know these conditions have changed so that you know when you eat a monster you gain some benefit for yourself um, mm -hmm. so we hope that you know that even if you're not going with a, a sort of framework of a magically irradiated wasteland <laughs> with da you know extra dangerous creatures that yeah. needs a kind of barbarian like this you can still find some use for it right 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 well, speaking of consuming monsters, our Patreon has a monster backlog of podcasts that if you support for five bucks a month, you can listen to. Uh, it's just more of this, just a lot longer, and we hope you enjoy it. Um, so getting back to the subclasses here, 
um, the Druid. This one is in the yeah. actual Kickstarter promo. So yes. uh, people might have already read on this, read read this <laughs> one up. But it's one that was from your Land Between Two Rivers campaign. It's gone through a few changes. But, yep. like, let's let's tell the people if they haven't. What, give me the pitch. What's 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 this uh, Circle of the Broken Land? Yeah, so Circle of the Broken Land Druid is a barbarian-inspired melee druid uh, who channels the primordial fury of, of this hellish, hellish wasteland. You know, druids have, as part of their sort of baked-in story, this spiritual connection to the landscape, to the environment. Right. And, th and that still exists in the wastelands, right? Like, there's still... Uh, nature it's just devastated and and yeah. you know ruinous and recovering from this like near fatal uh, uh blow and so i like a dnd &D world that uh has both a supernatural and natural enmeshed very closely so that the natural world has spirits and things like that represented by right. elementals and certain fey creatures uh certain plant creatures and that this druid is has a connection to those things which suffered this tremendous cataclysm and what used to be a source of you know wisdom and and power and comfort has become a source of pain that connection and so the circle of broken land druid taps into that pain they 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 are the ones where the ghosts of triads come to them and say, like you have to avenge us what happened yeah. here was was an injustice you have to do something and then mm -hmm. taking that and, and making a druid that is there to lay a beat down on the uh, people responsible for this apocalypse or those who seek to exploit it further and cause uh, additional harm. Um, and so it's, it's very much a in-your-face uh, melee caster type uh, subclass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, moving on to our second point here, it seems then pretty obvious how this subclass is shaped and and fits into the wasteland like it is yeah. just a natural extension you're almost an avatar of the wasteland yeah. itself and in, yeah. in in more of a, a truer sense than than normal because normally mm -hmm. nature's just serene calm and balanced and this yeah. uh nature's got a chip on its shoulder right <laughs> yeah yeah something terrible happens to it and and you yeah. know there it, it, like i said i i like a dnd &D game where the the fantasy is all encompassing there's, there's no yeah. place where there's not, you know, that we can just like, oh, we'll forget about it. It works exactly like it does in our own world. Like, uh, maybe it does, but there's a supernatural element to it. And in this case, yeah. it's those spirits of the land that uh, cry out for vengeance. And so, you know, in terms of like the feel of the class or how it, how it plays, we want you to feel like a badass. We want you to feel like mm -hmm. someone that you know can summon a you know flaming sword or a, or just a magic piece of scrap wood that you picked up <laughs> and use that to uh, to bring justice to uh, uh, you know to the to the enemies of nature and and in this case specifically like retribution and vengeance and mm -hmm. and the like and so the story is one of like someone who is connected with the you know this ever-present moment of the apocalypse this 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 instant of cataclysm they're always connected to it and always shaped by it um you know we have a barbarian inspired sort of rage-esque uh feature which provides some benefits that sort of shores up some of the druids uh weaknesses druid tends to be a bit of a fragile class uh, my personal experience is they die really easily <laughs> most most of my fifth edition characters who have died have been druids uh yeah. and so that shapes uh some of how the class plays um interesting but then they also have some survival uh elements too <laughs> What's yeah that? It's, it's, it's interesting jim that the, that the horrific ending of your druids, one could say their apocalypses, brought Certainly, you yeah. to create a subclass <laughs> that is avenging the apocalypse. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, this is one, the druid uh, uh, Circle of the Broken Land is one that, that has gone through a lot of design iterations. And it started mm -hmm. life as primarily a caster druid who could exchange hit points for extra damage and then morphed into a melee druid uh, in, in large part because... I miss a melee druid from second edition, and I want mm -hmm. one in fifth edition. So 
They made so, one. so you would say then uh, for players out there that, that would that the fact that it's kind of a meant to be a melee druid is the main hook for this class. Right? Yeah, yeah, certainly, yeah, yeah. It's it's there for like you know you don't want to be a moon druid. You don't necessarily want to do the spore route, but you like the idea of, of a a warrior druid, which to me is very mm -hmm. iconic, but also been so far missing. Uh, in my play experience from 5e and so that's that that it drives a lot of the design decisions there um and right. then the wasteland survival uh elements to it are, are there because the wasteland mm -hmm. druid should be good at surviving in the wasteland and overcoming the challenges of it but not so good that it's an auto success it should come with some kind of cost whether that's the chance for failure or uh more role play costs like well you know you gotta eat dirt and gravel and sand <laughs> in order to like stave off thirst and that's just yeah, you know yeah. not everybody's into that some people might yeah. react negatively to it <laughs> that kind of thing yeah. <laughs> well if they were a kid and were given a mud pie they might get triggered by that um, so <clears throat> i would say that probably this is one of the more interesting classes to fit in a regular 5e campaign but how would yeah. you say that a circle of a broken land would fit I would say that you could use it as like representing a specific instance. So like a circle of a broken land druid in a non wastelands game represents like a specific elemental ghost, right? Like this is a, this is a singular individual and doesn't represent like an archetype. Um, mm -hmm. So it could be that there's like a localized apocalypse. This, this forest was burned down by a red dragon and, and the collective spirits of all the dryads, treants and things like that there mm -hmm. demand vengeance. And, you know, perhaps you undergo a transformation from going from your normal circle and then taking on a circle of the broken land as this tragedy happens, you know, like I started life as a shepherd druid <laughs> uh, and then something terrible or happened <laughs> or a land druid. And now I'm, you know, they switched subclasses uh, for it. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, it's something that uh, you could reskin and, and just make it sort of like an elemental warrior that they are someone from mm -hmm. the elemental planes or trained by someone like that, that, that has these powers and, and you just reskin the flavor of it. Uh, to be more just, you know, an elemental warrior type. Yeah, I was thinking as soon as you uh, said that first example, I immediately went back to what we've been talking about in a lot, which is uh, the Mornland from Eberron. By yeah, yeah. Being yeah. a circle of the broken land. Oh, I'm from the I'm from the Mornland. And everybody kind of goes, oh, uh, right. OK. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm here to avenge that. <laughs> I'm going to yeah. need all your names. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm going to take those. Um, anyway. <clears throat> all right. Let's, uh, speaking of another uh, survival type, uh, yeah. minded type, uh, the ranger. We have, uh, we're calling it the the scavenger uh, yeah. archetype. Uh, so uh, give, me, uh, give me your elevator pitch for that, man. So the scavenger archetype is a, a wasteland uh, survival specialist who is able to exploit and make use of the, the resources of the ruins. Like one of the hallmarks of post-apocalyptic uh, gaming, whether it's sci-fi or fantasy, is the idea that this prior civilization has fallen and you're living in that, that either immediate aftermath, you either experienced it yourself or like a few generations out. Um, but it's, it's still impacting the the course of life in the setting right it's still the most significant mm -hmm. thing that's happened and so the scavenger looks at this landscape of ruin and goes this is my home i live here i i'm i'm you know like as a as an archetype that fits into the setting they are they represent those individuals who go out into the wastes to exploit these resources like you're you're in a point in their civilizational cycle as it were that that it's still better to steal from the fallen civilization than to create or make themselves. They might not be in a position to, but there's all this like ready-made stuff out there that's rotting and rusting and corroding and the like. And so the scavenger goes into these places and navigates the dangers that are there and can make use of what they find. The ranger chassis is a real solid like core for this because they're already good in the wilderness. Right, yeah. like baseline PHB Ranger, <laughs> you know, that's the only thing we can assume. We don't know if you're using revised or Tasha's or whatever. You know, there's a lot of the a lot about the meta game that surrounds Ranger we can't account for because it's individual to the table. But we can say like 
the baseline ranger has these assumptions in it and they're already good at surviving in the wasteland let's make them good at this specific task of survival which is gathering and exploiting the resources uh, that are in these ruins yeah i mean to me like any fan of like the far cry games or ghost of tsushima any of those games where it's all about just being on an island getting all the resources <clears> upgrading <throat> your gear yourself you know like it's just like built in right there also like i can't not think of macgyver I think I've heard that joke yeah, right. many times <laughs> about the scavenger. It's just like imagining MacGyver in the wasteland, just like a couple of dragon right. scales and a and a and a basculus gall, and yeah. Oh no, no, here you go. This will do magic missile like twice. Or, you know, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Because because we want to do things and include things that that relate to like gear breaking down and needing repairs and like that. Modeling the fact that society's infrastructure is gone, you can't just go and buy some new gear uh, you scavenge yeah. it and repair it and m keep it going as long as you can like the idea that a, a class can provide they can gear themselves up from nothing a, a gear you know a, ra a scavenger ranger with no equipment alone in the wilderness can come out of that wilderness with weapons armor gear just fine you know they, they survived they didn't die <laughs> you know like yeah, yeah. that kind of uh, uh, play experience is what we wanted to uh, to feel like this is their home and the party's right. lucky to have them, you know. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. We, so we've kind of literally answered three questions about this class. <laughs> one, one big answer, like how do they fit? Well, it's pretty obvious. And what do yeah. you want it to feel like? Well, you can fix anything. You're you're the guy who's like, oh no no, hang on, I got a few pieces of bone here. I'll fix your hammer. You'll be good as you'll be good as uh, you know. Good as right, gold, right. even though nobody knows what gold is anymore because it's the wasteland. Right. Yeah, um, <laughs> but what, uh, what's, what, what's one of the main hooks, though, other than just, like, uh, survival uh, for this class? Yeah, yeah. So we're really wanting to lean in and sort of uh, go with, like, the the artificer-esque aspects uh, of this. And, and you know, we, we can't use the artificer because of the way the SRD is, but we can be inspired by the idea of it. And this ranger is very much inspired by that. We want them to be able to quickly make gear that is worth a damn right like mm -hmm. this isn't like oh i'm making something that's going to break after the next fight it's it's like no I, I i really can equip us in gears given time i can fashion what we need out of this out of the resources of this place and not just that but i can like make use of the items that i find they'll have access to the technomancy spells or at least some of them right like they exist in mm -hmm. this hybrid space like the ranger usually does Right, the ranger yeah. has always been a hybrid kind of character concept, and in this one, part what we're bringing in is the techno magic side of that, uh, adding it on to the sort of the nature's warrior, uh, wilderness warrior type, um, mm -hmm. because so much of the wasteland is the ruins of a, a fallen civilization. Yeah, totally. Uh, and uh, so uh, it seems to me that. Um, this subclass can fit pretty pretty easily into a regular 5e campaign. Would you agree? Yeah, oh, certainly. I, I would say that any any subclass uh, or, or any campaign setting that, that features the artificer, uh, the scavenger could fit into as sort of a bootleg artificer, someone that that takes like the, you know, what what they're doing over there with their experimentation and you know, and creating these uh, magical objects and the like. Like that the scavenger ranger is is sort of slapdash and and hasty um, and and much more practical about it. Um, you also sort of reflavor it as a as a certain type of of rogue uh, if you'd like. You know, there's there's a lot about being able to be like good with devices and 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 things that yeah. does overlap with like trap finding and trap making and and opening locks and things like that. So you could look at it as a, a an alternate take on uh on a skill specialist rogue kind of uh, character mm -hmm. and if you use that new uh ua with uh alternate uh <laughs> subclasses for multiple classes you know, right yeah, yeah. At it, maybe you could um but speaking of the rogue, let's let's Ooh. bounce on over here uh no pun intended yeah. to our enforcer uh yep. rogue our strength-based rogue yeah, you've mm -hmm. been doing a lot of a uh, lot. This is this is one of your uh, babies. This is one of your like you've wanted a strength based rogue for so long. <laughs> I this is my thing. I don't like I get how, you know, rogues. It's all based around dexterity and being lithe and hitting a precise point. But what's to say that maybe 
you have a rogue that didn't skip arm day. And, right. But they still speak thieves can't. They still speak. They can still do traps and the whole thing. It's just like they don't yeah. sneak around maybe as well, or they could. You could True. still have a high dexterity and put expertise into that. That's up to you. But what I wanted was basically this is the muscle that the thieves guild gets when they don't want to go to the fighters guild. Like they right. have to sure. have some people in their ranks that the brother of the the the, the high class thief. You know, he's like, well, he, yeah, he can punch stuff. He uh, just don't bring him inside, you know, L keep him outside yeah. to keep watch. Right. So like, that is the thing here. They are the bouncer. Like that's, uh, right. th that's kind of the thing. So what, uh, uh, what, what we, what I was thinking, at least for the wasteland is like, you know, if you're out in the wasteland, you know, rogue generally is, is seen as kind of a. Um, a, a, a either range DPS or like a glass cannon. You don't really want to yeah, get yeah, up in combat, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, I was like, no, no, you, you want to do that because this is more about like grappling. And yeah. I wanted to expand grappling to be able to be like, well, you know, if you grapple someone, that's just like arm bars and, and choke holds and like, <laughs> it's kind of like Batman. And yeah, yeah. Would, wouldn't you want to be able to just like come up behind someone, get them in a thing and just drag them into the shadows as you're kind of knocking them out or whatever? So I. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's like a lot of bandit groups in a wasteland, right? Like one of the one of the hallmarks of a post apocalyptic setting is like the breakdown oh, yeah. of social order and, and how, you know, the, the small sort of roving group of, of, of wanderers and adventurers and the like uh, can easily become uh, a group of brigands and bandits and, and robbers. Oh, and, yeah. and so like the enforcer fits into that story of of you know, they hit hard. They're a bruiser. What do you want them to do? They can mangle somebody. And like mm -hmm. every two bit warlord out there wants as many of them as they can get. Uh, because you know, the, the fighters and the like, you know, they got their own ideas about how to do things. They got their own ideas about, uh, you know, code of codes of honor and reputation and nah. yeah. Bru yeah there's none of that here. Pure, pure, just like arm breaking, <laughs> You know, that, that, well, that's, uh, that's bad. That, that's exact. Yeah, that's exactly what we want want the field to be. And also, by the way, totally going to bring back the sap. I'm sorry. It needs to be back for real. Yeah. So that's going to yeah. be in there, too. It'll 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 be fun. Sucker a little punch. fun interaction. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. But yeah, just cool. that, the feeling of being able to sneak around, but also like when you need to. I'm going to take that guy out and just drag him off behind this building, take care of him, come back out. Right. Like, it's just an idea that uh, a strictly dexterity based rogue, uh, it doesn't really work. So, yeah, it doesn't you know, work so well. Yeah. We so so mechan <laughs> mechanically, what are some of the, the sort of mechanical hooks you're thinking of, uh, including in the class, subclass? Uh, well, uh, again, like we're talking about, expanding uh, grappling so you can actually uh, uh, do damage and use your sneak attack during like da a damaging grapple i'm mm -hmm. also uh, also thinking about um alternate ways of using your sneak attack like again with a sap one would think you know the whole light what's the whole thing you come up behind someone pop them on the back of the head they're down so right. what if we what if you sacrifice your uh sneak attack damage for this round to try to impose the incapacitated condition they have to make a mm -hmm. save if they fail you come up behind them you still have to hit so it is two rolls but there's, you know, it's right. not really damage. You're just knocking them out. Maybe you roll the D4 for the sap. You know, they take sure, that. Yeah, yeah. But then, like, you know, they're out for, you know, X amount of rounds. And that's just, that's how you do that. Like, I, we need to get past them, knock this guy out, move on, let the people behind you take care of them, tie them up as you move right. through and continue to clear an area. Uh, that's yeah. that's kind yeah, of what yeah, I'm thinking that. of. Uh, also, probably some bonuses to like insight, intimidation. You know, you mm. got to be a good doorman, right? You got to be able to look people up and down, know who's the most dangerous, <laughs> and scare the <laughs> weak ones a away. Room. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got to be able to look a room up and down. Uh, yeah. I will say there probably. I'm not sure the final iteration of this, but there will probably be some good synergy with the tavern brawler feat. I'm just going to put that mm. out there. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. But a yeah, like brawler that's, that's, is what that's this really, kind of, really reads like. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, like that's why I, I came from the idea of a bouncer as instead mm -hmm. of just being a, a, a just a fighter at the door, like, no, no, no. What if they're part of the Thieves Guild? They're just yep. the big guy they put on the door because this is what they're good at. This is what they're yeah. really good at. 
Yeah, and and that's an easy concept to fit into non wastelands kind of games, right? Like this, Any, the, yeah. of, of all the ones we've talked about, this rogue is really one where it's like it's it's not necessarily like unique to the wasteland and as like broken land, you know, druid would, mm-hmm. but it can easily fit into other concepts. Um, yeah, an all thieves guild kind of uh, game where where mm-hmm. you you need that inside yeah. info, but you don't all want to play high dex characters. <laughs> Well, yeah, and besides, you know, I mean, yeah, you could send the assassin to go kill someone or be like, hey, Bobby, go get him and bring him back here and just, right. just keep it on the down low. And <laughs> they're going to go sneak up. They're going to knock him out. They're going to tie him up and they're going to carry him back quietly. And that's the thing. It's like, why could, why shouldn't you be able to do that? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. So let's get to our last uh, subclass here. You mentioned it before. But uh, let's let's dig in uh, let's dig into to the to the tech of it. Uh, the let's wizard, it. the school of technomancy. Yeah, oh man. Yeah. I mean, you can't yeah. do an artificer. But no, <laughs> <laughs> that's shame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in many ways, that's that is a, a, a you know sort of our answer to uh, the artificer, and we're you know, placing it firmly in in a in, you know with the wizard because this is based on like a a magical conception of technology not unlike say eberron's and so uh the technomancer is this junkyard mage that can unlock the magic of the the fallen civilization right like as as a technomancer moves about the wasteland and and you know they represent someone that knows something they they've retained some information about the past mm-hmm. and and like furthermore who's making paper and ink and the like for spell books who's teaching spells who did yeah. which which libraries of magic survived the apocalypse like the the pre-fallen sort of implied setting here of, of, of the the wastelands is that uh magic of of constructs and objects and materials and the like was very prevalent that that, that was a maybe the dominant form of magic of the society that fell and so this wizard has a connection to that and and they have traditional spell casting, right? They can do everything that a wizard can do, but that uh, they have access to the technomancy spell list, which will be included. Includes things like, you know, turn this uh, pile of rubble <laughs> into an an animated conveyance, uh, so that you can mm. you know uh, drive across these salt flats quickly. Or like, oh, that's a rusting iron golem. Like, well, I'm just going to take command of it real quick uh, and and have it work for us for a bit. You know. Mm. Um, and so, like, this is a, a a person that that has secret knowledge and and maintains an air of, of mystery around themselves because some of the things they do are just tricks, you know, just like they just know how to operate these devices, they know how they work, they can power them, you know, and 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 fuel them and the like. But then it's also genuine magic that that they wield as well. And so, that line between what's technology, what's magic, what isn't. The technomancer sort of like keeps it blurred because that's where they get their power from. That's where they draw yeah. their uh, their mystique uh, from. <laughs> yeah, the technomancer's answer to that question is yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is it yep, technology? Exactly. Is it magic? Is it some between? Right. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's it. Yep. Uh-huh. Exactly. <laughs> what they don't know is all these pieces of technology. They, I mean, they have instructions written on the inside, like in. Oh sure, yeah. They, they, they all know, came with instructional like, runes. You just have to know how to read them. <laughs> yeah, you just have to know how to read them. That's because that's what I'm assuming is like a lot of spells and stuff would be like chiseled or like you know inscribed on like metal and stuff like that, sure, and maybe yeah, yeah. that survived. And so if you yeah. do want a spell book, you're carrying around like slabs of. <laughs> Of titanium. Essentially, yeah, yeah, like copper they, plates. Yeah, that the barbarian like that, yeah. has to carry everywhere. Um, right, anyway, right, yeah. Um, <laughs> so they're out in the wasteland. Uh, obviously, uh, with all of the debris and detritus from previous, uh, previous era's technology just strewn about, they're going to yeah. have ample opportunity to, 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 you know, practice their craft, right? Certainly, certainly, yeah. the The idea is that that objects and, and materials are, are a uh, a big part of it. So, for example, one of the things we're looking at is saying that if a spell has a material component, that's the only component you need, right? You can ignore verbal and somatic components 
as long as this spell has a material component. There's there's something about those material components in D&D that I like. It, it, they define Dungeons and Dragons sort of magic for mm-hmm. me. The fact that you need a little bit of sulfur and back guano to make fireball or or you know two copper pennies for detect thoughts or something like like the fact that they're sort of puns aside <laughs> like oh, that yeah. that <laughs> that's <it> so, <laughs> right that so much of of D&D magic is already grounded in material things you know that Mm -hmm. we want to lean into that and and play with it perhaps doing something different with their spell focus being able to boost it or amplify it so that it's not it's not just something they need to cast spells but it it provides further benefit um and also potentially making the technomancer a a pet class um you know someone that had that sort of builds their own scrap golem uh, you know, bespoke uh, construct uh, go over <laughs> over time. Artisanal golem. Right, yeah. yeah, it makes modifications to it and like, okay, well I need you to do this today or, you know, um, to represent that uh, connection with, with um, mm-hmm. you know, technology and, and specifically yeah. magical technology. Yeah, what I like, what I like about this uh, and the, the feel of it is like, yeah, you can kind of, if you squint, you'll be like, okay, I see why you did this instead of Artificer. Because like uh, I'm thinking of like Alita Battle Angel and mm. Christoph Waltz's character Doc Ito, who just mm. re- finds and repairs robots, and that's what he does. And like it's like yeah, he could that's a, a post-apocalypse, and he could be an yeah. artificer or he's just a technomancer. He knows how to put yeah. these things together and make them work. You know. Yeah, yeah. He knows the spells of repair and activation that uh, mm-hmm. power these things as well. Yeah. Yeah, and so. Um, Obviously, the mechanical hook for this is that that manipulation of technology of of, of you know golems and and uh, or or uh, automatons, if you prefer. Um, yeah, yeah. So that being said, how would someone put this in a normal trad <laughs> fantasy D and D campaign? Because like this is one of those. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Ah, yeah, you're gonna have yeah, to stretch yeah. pretty far. Bit of a stretch, right? Uh, so you'd use it if you don't want an artificer. If you can see a place for something like an artificer without wanting a full one through twenty class that that has a, a place in the world and, and that implies things about it, you could use a school of technomancy wizard to represent like lone eccentrics or or you know the like this person is famous for creating their constructs. There's already things like this in baseline. D&D. There's the apparatus mm-hmm. of Qualish. There's uh, Lum the Mad. Uh, there, there's all kinds of like... Folding boat. Right, like somebody's making uh, uh, iron golems and writing it, it, you know, in, instruction manuals on how to do it. Like, There's already some of this baked into D&D because of D&D's origins as a science fantasy mixed genre game that's become yeah. something else. So like those trappings of it that are already present the the techno uh, uh, technomancy wizard can like fit into that without needing to make this huge you know sort of like oh yeah there's also a school of artificers and you know they mm-hmm. do all these other things like you just want one off you you want the impact of techno magic to be minimal or unique uh, this would be a way to uh, to accomplish that yeah and because they're still a wizard right world. like they're still casting spells and like, that's yeah, still the yeah. primary thing that they're they're doing it's just flavored with this. Uh, uh, technomancy yeah and if you do want both uh you know school of technomancy and artifice or maybe just artificers are people who just flunked out of what their wizard school of technomancy. <laughs> the so right, like, right. Ah, i just learned some tricks and i just put it together uh you know on the back end yeah, who cares? Yeah. <laughs> right right these elitist <laughs> wizards with their spell books and everything yeah <laughs> Have my right to cast a uh, bill passed. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, I'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right, well, um, everyone, we don't want to keep you after after subclass too long. Uh, just please uh, remember, uh, obviously, if you aren't already subscribed to the channel, please do hit that, hit that, hit the bell to get notifications. Like this video if you liked it. Um, but also, check out the Kickstarter. Uh, it is over on Sunday the 11th. Uh, of July and uh, just so you know we are going to do a live hangout uh, right at the end of the Kickstarter just to kind of like uh, like a closing out party a little bit just to kind of be like Ooh, we did it um, yeah. and then uh, just so you know we are going to be taking next week off after the Kickstarter this has been uh, an amazing experience but also a very draining one so we're taking the next <laughs> week off there will not be a video on the 14th we'll be back on the following week 
uh, just like we always are every Wednesday. Uh, so go out there and uh, roll some dice. Thank you.